Heather is primarily known by her online moniker, Heather Vicente, where she explores the intersection of technology, culture, and identity. Let me see if I give her your presentation. There we are. Heather Slagle. Um, uh, most people know me online as Heather Vescent, and if you want to follow along on Twitter, I'm very active, so um, my uh, Twitter handle is right there, Heather Vescent. And if you want to pose questions to me during the session, uh, you can send them to me on Twitter. I'm not going to be looking at it until slightly afterwards. But um, so today, I want to tell you about my project on the future of alternate currency and transactions. And this really just is a runaway class assignment that I got very obsessed with. Really was just starting out to like complete some homework, and uh, that was a year and a half ago. So what ended up happening is I did a survey um, and some interviews. I had over 220 participants respond to 23 questions last fall. I followed that up with about 20 one-on-one -on -one, uh, interviews, anywhere from 30 minutes to two hours, with people like Stan Salnecker, Mickey Krimmel, uh, Tara Hunt, um, a lot of people who are doing very interesting things in this area. And then in addition to that, I did all the standard research and scanning. So first thing I'm going to do is share with you some results from that research, which led me to a few trends I'm going to share with you a little later. First question I wanted to know is like, what are people using today? So if we look in the green, these are kind of like the online banking and online payments. You can see it's got pretty high um, penetration. A lot of people are using this. This is pretty standard and comparable to other data and research I've seen elsewhere done. In the middle here, these orange is the online currency and virtual game currencies, um, a much smaller area that I found is really happening in niche markets, in niche communities, where these currencies are needed to actually purchase something in that area. So, you know, if you, if it's like currency in any com country, you know, if you can pay for things with a credit card or with American dollar, you're not going to exchange the currency to the local currency unless it, there's something there that you want, that you can't buy in any other currency. Uh, mobile banking is emerging, and actually, I would, if I did this survey now, I think that these numbers would be bumped. Um, the hype around mobile banking and mobile transactions has really exploded uh, in spring of this year. And interestingly, from my research, these blue ones are random acts of kindness and pro bono. These are not tracked on any financial balance sheet, and they're like at 60 plus percent of people said they participate in those. Very surprising to me. So then I wanted to know how do people pay for things? Online or offline they pay with credit, debit, and cash. Online primarily credit, PayPal, and then debit. What's the economic participation? We, you hear about all these different economies, the gift economy, the barter economy, social capital, woofy. I was like, well, do people actually participate in these? Well, they do. Um, anywhere from uh, 40 to um, over 50% say they participate in these variety of uh, alternate economies. One thing I'm going to mention is time banks. Just like, how many people here have heard of time banks or familiar with it? Wow, this is a lot more than most people that I talk to. Well, usually, I'm lucky if I have one or two people in a room. So th the time banking is definitely an emerging local phenomenon that people are coming together to create a more sustainable economy for themselves while they have less money. And basically, the idea is like an hour of my time is worth an hour of your time. So let's talk about some trends. The first one I'm going to talk about is alternate currencies. This picture is a copy of is, uh, some coins that were created for uh, Yuri's Night. And I think of alternate currencies in four different buckets. First, there's the gaming currencies. Those are pretty easy. It's like World of Warcraft, Linden. These are coins and currencies you need to use to play or participate into these games. Then there's corporate currencies. These are rewards points, frequent flyer miles, other things that started as kind of more marketing activities, but really, you know, being able to trans change or transfer um, uh, frequent flyer miles, that's something a lot of people are interested in doing. There are, the next two are kind of more emerging, the social capital currencies. These are more ephemeral, uh, reputation, uh, uh, recommendations, ratings. I'll talk a little bit more about those in a moment. And then, Really interestingly are these what I'm calling value encoded currencies. And these are like the Venn and Bitcoin. So let me just talk a little bit about these. How many people here have heard of Venn? One? Okay. 
the Vantu. So um, the Vantu uh, is a currency, is a global currency uh, created by Stephen Solnecker. It is uh, based on a basket of currencies. It's not like a dollar to dollar exchange. And it has um, carbon uh, weightings in it, so it's carbon neutral. And the concept behind it is if you, you, you go to uh, hubs where the Venn is taken as the currency, and then you can buy internet services. It's kind of like co working with an alternate currency. Probably, how many people here are part of Bitcoin? Right, like very hot topic. Uh, when I first started looking to this, Bitcoin was just kind of a little, little interest, and it's really heated up in the last few uh, months. This is a peer to peer um, anonymous currency. Um, really trying to be like e-gold for geeks and um, really wanting to do transactions. There's no banks, it's anonymous. And the thing that is the most interesting about both of these currencies to me is that there are values encoded in the DNA of these currencies. With the Venn, it's about being international, it's about being aware and sustainable of the environment. With Bitcoin, it's about being anonymous, about uh, decentralized, being able to be peer-to-peer. Those, to me, are the most interesting things about these currencies. So I would be remiss if I didn't mention mobile innovations. Um, I'm not going to show any charts or anything about these because I think it's anyone who's looking into this area knows that near-field communication is becoming very big, getting baked into mobile phone hardware as well as credit cards. QR codes, though, while right now are only being used for uh, uh, linking URLs, have the possibility to do a lot more for payments. Of course, we've got smartphone, applica smartphone applications from PayPal applications, banking applications. Another question in my research, I asked if people use uh, banking, online banking applications, and there was very high usage of those. So the transition to using mo uh, mobile applications to pay for things is very easy. People are used to using their apps. Um, to do things. And of course, Google Wallet announcement, that's been a new thing that's come out since um, I've been doing this research. And finally, I want to mention Square Up, which continues to get VC funding and just a lot of backing, a lot of transactions happening with that. And here's just some pictures of some of that technology with the near field communication payment, Square, and the QR code. So credit cards are also innovating. Like I mentioned, you're getting um, NFC baked into some uh, credit cards. Being able to tie multiple credit cards to one, activate it, I want to pay with this credit card, not having to carry around a lot of credit cards. Having a single charge authorization and PIN code confirmation. These are all new technologies. I don't think these cards are widely available. They're in beta right now. So there are innovations happening within the credit card industry. These are the technology uh, innovations that are happening, but there are also shifts within mindset. The big one, collaborative consumption. So finally, the values of environmental and reuse, and these things are, we're coming into a post-consumer world where we have all of this stuff, and maybe we're done with it, but we're not just content to throw it away. So we're interested in reusing and recycling and sharing these things. And there are systems that are being created to make it easy for people to do this. Most of these are non-financial transactions. It's not just about, hey, I'm going to go sell my old printer. It's like, oh, I'm getting a new printer. Here's this old printer. What's the alternate to throwing it away? Well, giving it to someone who might need it. I love this picture. Here you have, like, the woman on the left has the deer head, the guy on the right has this uh, toy, and um, this has been a toy swap, so the guy showed up with the deer head, and the woman showed up with the toy, and neither of them wanted it. Like, the guy's like, deer head? No, I, I need to get this to my girlfriend's, like, I need to get this out of the house. And they went to this fence and swapped it, and you can see how happy they are. This no money, no money exchange hands here. They each got rid of something they didn't want, and they each got something they thought was really awesome. There are a lot of sites that are happening, starting up for this. Um, free sector neighbor goods. Neighbor, how many people are familiar with neighbor goods? What? Neighbor goods is a site where you can um, uh, list stuff that you have, like a power drill or a cooler, that you'd be willing to lend to your neighbors. So instead of your neighbors having to go out like on a camping trip, oh, I need a cooler for that. Oh. Oh, my neighbor has a cooler, I can just borrow it. These non-financial transactions create stronger bonds. These stronger bonds 
uh, our positive reinforcement for more of these uh, more of these transactions to happen, and this strengthens local community. What these all do is, it's not about replacing the traditional economy. It's not about saying, no, we don't want to buy any more coolers. It's about extending it. One thing I didn't really get into very much is this concept of ratings and recommendations. So here, this, like, I love this picture too, right? There's obviously something going on in that transaction that is not just about, hey, I'm buying something from the convenience store. You know, if you look at Yelp, you see, what was my experience like there? Am I rating? I'm recommending it. Like, I have LinkedIn recommendations. What did people think of different things I've done? Now, I can't cash out my LinkedIn recommendations to pay my rent, but it does influence my ability and my cash flow income. So don't think about these alternate currencies or transactions or economies as replacing the existing one, but as but rather extending it beyond into areas that currently it doesn't exist. Yesterday, Mez mentioned um, being able to bring in um, expendables into a market system. And I thought, wow, what if these alternate currencies are a way to take these non-traditional ideas and values and be able to bring it into the market system? I'm, I'm personally very interested to explore that. So what could a future scenario look like? I like to use this concept of dinner with friends. It's something we always do. Probably everyone's done this, this conference. So you're out to dinner with friends. The bill comes. You have to split up the bill. Sometimes it has. Actually, here in Vancouver, it's great. They bring you like your separate bills. Well, where I live in LA, they don't. <laughs> and so how do you pay for this? So the scenario is there's a lot of different ways you can pay for it. With your mobile phone that might have your phone communication baked in with um, privacy dongles that are maybe an evolution of like Bitcoin where you just snap it into a smart check that automatically transfers. Why can't you leave the waiter a tip in frequent flag miles? I, that, I'd love that. I'd love to be able to do that. And I'm actually taking this scenario and turning it into a short film that I will be presenting at a conference in Toronto um, at Cybos. So, uh, and I, it will eventually be available <coughs> online. Also, this um, scenario is online on my website in prose form. But this is not the only scenario. There are other possibilities as well. Um, there's this concept of the value score, um, which is, uh, what do I value? What do you value? Kind of like a dating algorithm, matching up what we value together and a score based on that. So, hey, I might love Thai food and you might love Thai food. But, um, so you'd want to know my Thai food recommendations, but if you don't love Thai food, then you don't really care about my Thai food recommendations. Of course, we have to mention biometric payment, at least biometric confirmation with a thumb or an eye, thumbprint or eye scan. But, like, why not have the financial, this is a scary idea, financial information encoded into your, your real DNA? I don't know, maybe. <laughs> Um, there's this concept of a single point of payment, you know, or, and similar to uh, universal global currency. Universal global currency, there's no diversity in currencies that's alternate. Um, but if we have single point of payment, a single card or device, why not have financial AI associated with that that knows, okay, when you pay for groceries, you pay for it out of this account, or when you pay the farmer's market, you pay with this, some kind of uh, financial tracker. So finally, in closing, I want to talk about or ask you, leave you with some questions of how will you participate in this emerging area? How will you shape it if you would like to? Support it? Oppose it? I'd like to mention one opportunity. We have the technology. We can build these systems. It's not about the technology. What it is is about how are we defining and matching these things. It's, it's about what the syntax is and means and matching them up. One challenge is our existing infrastructure. This is a picture of the IRS. You know, will they ever, <laughs> would they ever accept payment in frequent buyer miles? <laughs> could I ever pay my taxes in time bank hours, uh, contributing directly to my local community and my expertise? I don't know. My final recommendation is, this is a picture of um, the Internet Identity Workshop. It's a, a community that I participate occasionally within. In the middle is Kalia Ham Hamlin, and she's a facilitator who brings this group together on internet identity. She's been doing it for probably like six or eight years. 
and it's a uh, people from the government, people from businesses, big companies, Sun, Microsoft, small startups, all come together twice a year and have conversations about identity and what kind of technology we're going to build and how we're going to build and how we're going to work together. And you know, I, to me, that seems like the exact way we need to go forward and working together with these alternate currencies and virtual currencies and the technologies, so how they can work together. So, if you have any questions, you'd like to see the presentation, it will be online later today. Um, I, you can also visit my website it, uh, or email me. My website is heatherbesson.com. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them right now.